your muscles can move at full speed. And then if you push off the wall lightly, you, you, you fly zoom. across, zoom, zoom across. So yeah. how does the physics of that work for, can you still play soccer, for example, in space? You can, but one of the most uh, intuitive things that we all learn as babies, right, is whenever you throw something, if I was going to toss something to you, I'd toss it up because I know that it has to compensate for the fact that that Keplerian arc is going to draw it down. The, you know, equations of motion are going to draw it down. I would, in space, I would just shoot something directly towards you. So like mm -hmm. straight line of sight. And so that would be very different for any type of ball sport is to retrain your human mind to have that as your intuitive arc of motion or lack of arc. From your experience, from understanding how astronauts get adjusted to this stuff, how long does it take to adjust to the physics of this world, mm -hmm. this other world? So even after one or two parabolic flights, you can gain a certain facility with moving in that environment. I think most astronauts would say maybe several days on station or a week on station and their brain flips. It's amazing the plasticity of the human brain and how quickly they are able to adapt. And so pretty quickly they become creatures of this new environment. Okay, so that's cool. It's, it's, it's creating a little bit of an experience. What about if you go for more than 100 days, mm. for one year, for two years, for three years? Yeah. What challenges start to emerge in that case? So Scott Kelly wrote this amazing book after he spent a year in space, and he's a twin. It's absolutely fantastic that NASA <laughs> got to do a twin study. It's yeah. perfect. Um, so he wrote a lot about his experience on the health side of what changed, things like um, bone density, muscle atrophy, eyesight changing because the shape of your eyeball changes, which changes your lens, which changes how you see. If we're then thinking about the challenges between a year and three years, especially if we're doing that three-year trip to Mars for your friend who mm -hmm. asked earlier, then yep. you have to think about um, nutrition. And so how are you keeping all of these different needs for your body alive? How are you protecting astronauts against radiation? Either having some type of a shell on the spacecraft, which is expensive because it's heavy. You know, if it's something like lead, a really effective radiation shell, it's going to be a lot of mass. Or is there a pill that could be taken to try to make you um, less uh, in danger of some of the uh, radiation effects? A lot of this has not yet been answered, but radiation is a really significant challenge for that three-year journey. And what are the negative effects of radiation on the human body out in space? A higher likelihood to develop cancer at a younger age. Um, so you'd probably be able to get there and get back, but you'd find yourself um, in the same way if you were exposed to significant radiation on Earth, you'd find significant bad health effects as you age. What do you think about like decades? Mm -hmm. Do you think about decades? Or is yes. this like an entire I think about lifetime. centuries, centuries. <laughs> for my space arcs. But yeah, for decades, I think as soon as we get past the three-year mark, we'll absolutely want somewhere between three years and a decade, we'll want artificial gravity. And we know how to do that, actually. The engineering questions still need to be tweaked for how we'd really implement it, but the science is there to know how we would spin habitats in orbit, generate that force. So even if the entire habitat's not spinning, you at least have a treadmill part of the space station that is spinning. And you can spend some fraction of your day in a near to 1G environment and keep your body healthy. Wait, literally from just spinning? From spinning. Yes, centripetal force. That's so you generate this force. If you've ever been in those um, carnival rides, the gravitrons that spin you up around the side, that's the concept. And this is actually one of the reasons why we are spinning out a new company from my MIT spinning lab. Out, huh? Spinning out. Ha ha. That was <laughs> accidental, but well, <laughs> well noted space pun. It's like impossible Dad to jokes. avoid. Them. All right. Um, but yeah, we're spinning out a new company to look at next generation space architecture and how do we actually scale humanity's access to space. And one of the areas that we want to look at is artificial gravity. Is there a name yet? Yep, there's a name. We are brand new. We are just exiting stealth mode. So your podcast <laughs> listeners will literally be among some of the first to hear about it. It's called Aurelia Institute. Beautiful. Aurelia is an old English word for chrysalis. And the idea with this is that we, humanity, collectively, are at this next stage of our metamorphosis, like a chrysalis, into a spacefaring species. And so we felt that this was a good time, a necessary time, to think about next-generation space architecture, but also Starfleet Academy, if you know that reference from Star Trek. 